the next for the next group of philosophers we leave we leave Asia Minor and we move to southern Italy in this time in history southern Italy was still regarded as a part of Magna Graecia it was still a part of greater Greece because the Greeks had not only established colonies on the fringes of Asia Minor and on, in the, on the islands of the Aegean Sea, the Greeks had also established colonies in what is today known as, uh, as Italy. And we're going to find two schools of philosophy developing and in fact thriving in southern Italy. And the first one that we're going to look at is the school known as Pythagoreanism. Now, lots of people believe that there really was a historical person named Pythagoras, but his life is so, uh, the details of his life are so obscure that it's also possible that he's a purely fictional character. Your first acquaintance, your first acquaintance with Pythagoras came in whatever grade it was that you learned about the Pythagorean theorem. And that interest in mathematics is one of the major characteristics of the Pythagoreanism that we're going to start talking about. In, a, in an important sense, Pythagoreanism is the most important thing we've talked about, we will have talked about so far today. You can forget about the Milesians, they're really not that important. As long as you remember Heraclitus' use of the word logos, that's probably all you need to remember there. But in the case of the Pythagoreans, we're dealing with some influences that are going to last uh, for centuries uh, into the future. For one thing, Plato is going to evidence a very major influence from the, from the Pythagoreans. All of you have a copy of Plato's dialogue called the Phaedo. Let me just come right out and tell you that the view of the soul that you find that you'll be reading about in Plato's Phaedo is borrowed directly from the Pythagoreans. It is not a Socratic view of the soul. It wasn't something that Plato dreamed up on his own. He learned it from the Pythagoreans. Not only that, but you'll find three arguments for the immortality of the soul in the Phaedo. And there's a strong likelihood that those arguments for the immortality of the soul also come from the Pythagoreans. Let me tell you why. For one thing, the Pythagoreans stressed a strong difference between the body and the soul. What we have in the Pythagoreans is the first appearance of a body-soul dualism. Now, I realize I had said earlier that Plato was the first thinker in Western history to have a really clear view of the soul. That's true. But this first attempt to separate the body and the soul appears among the Pythagoreans. They taught that the body is not only physical and corruptible, will die, but they also taught that the body is an important source of much that's wrong in our lives, much that is evil within us stems from the influence of the material body. That which is most good about us is an, apparent, is an evidence of the soul operating within us. Soul is good, body is evil. Soul and body are different. The soul is immortal, the body will die. Okay, the soul is immortal, and of course the body is corruptible. The Pythagoreans also taught a doctrine of reincarnation. There's lots about this that's very fascinating to me because I see lots of affinities between the Pythagorean doctrine of reincarnation, transmigration of the soul, and certain uh, beliefs that we, we associate with some Eastern religions, such as Hinduism, for example. There's a strong temptation to believe that there must have been, way back in the hidden recesses of history, some kind of contact, and perhaps there was. 
We know that the people who came to inhabit India and brought these particular ideas uh, or, or were the source of this, this particular idea originally uh, came from uh, uh, the area around the Black Sea. And we know that um, the Pythagoreans were influenced by some earlier religious and philosophical systems that were rooted in the Black Sea region. But there's simply no history, no historical evidence that enables us to tie these, these disparate beliefs together. The key principle to understanding the Pythagoreans was for them the importance of gaining purity of soul. Nothing could possibly be more important for a Pythagorean than purifying his soul. In order to aid them in achieving the purification of the soul, they did a number of things. For one thing, they banded together into monastic-like communities, brotherhoods. I guess it, it wouldn't be at all incorrect to say that this is where the monastic strain that later will take up residence in Christianity and in other religions, really gets its start. Separate yourself from the world, organize yourself into communities with people who think like you do, and perhaps you can help each other achieve this important goal of purity of soul. Now, the Pythagoreans sought this purity of soul in a number of ways. They sought it in the, uh, to put in the crudest way uh, that we can uh, begin by noticing, through a number of very legalistic rules. Uh, the Pythagoreans seem to have thought that if only they could follow a certain pattern of life and obey a certain set of rules, that purity would, would come to them more naturally. Now today, many of these rules strike us, I think, as a little bit silly. For example, and I, I may get some of these backwards, but it really doesn't matter, all right? The Pythagoreans said that when you go to bed at night, you should go to bed, on, you, should, you should get into the bed on one side, and when you get up in the morning, you should get up on the other side, which I suppose means that you could get up on the wrong side of the bed some days, all right? The Pythagoreans said that when you take your shoes off, you should start with a left shoe, but when you put your shoes on, you should start with a right foot. I've often thought what it would be like to be an absent-minded Pythagorean. Think about that, you know. Which shoe do I begin with? Which side of the bed do I get out of? They also had other rules. One of their <laughs> rules was don't eat beans. Now, I, I, cannot, I cannot begin to give you a reason how observing that rule will help you achieve purity, but that was one of their rules. Another one of their rules, you can think about that, all right? <laughs> I better drop that subject. Another one of their rules was don't let the swallows light on your roof. This would help them achieve pu purity. Now think of all the fundamentalists in the world who've missed out on some of these rules, all right? Um, well, in addition to following these rules, most of which are pretty silly to us, I think, they also stressed the importance of numbers and mathematics. These people were actually the architects of early arithmetic. And the reason for their interest in numbers was, was not just some kind of idle scientific curiosity, they pursued the study of numbers because it would help them in their pursuit of purity. Here's why. You and I, they would say, fall into moral problems when we pay too much attention to our bodies, how our bodies look, how our bodies feel. But the body is the source of our difficulty. So what we want to do is ignore or forget the bodily part of ourselves and concentrate on our souls, on our minds. And what better way to do that than through the study of number? Now, as they played around with numbers, some interesting things came out. For example, they often did some of their numerical investigations using pebbles. 
They put pebbles in the sand. And the Greek word for pebble is the word calculus. It was a lot simpler in their days, I assure you. But one day, some Pythagorean was playing around with pebbles, which were representing numbers, and here's what he discovered. He discovered, for example, that certain numbers, like the number two, and what I'm doing here is drawing pebbles on the blackboard, certain numbers, like the number two, can be called oblong numbers because it makes a figure like a, a, a makes an oblong like figure. Or the number six is an oblong number. And you can go on and figure out what uh, the other oblong numbers would be. Certain other numbers are triangular numbers because when you, or, when you put those pebbles in the sand, like the number three, for example, or the number six, I gotta, or the number, let's, I gotta do this right here. Yeah. Well, there are triangular numbers. But there are also square numbers. For example, the number four, when laid out as pebbles, gives you a square. Or the number nine, when laid out as pebbles, gives you a square. And you can easily go on and, and see that uh, the other, the subsequent square numbers would be 16 and 36 and 49. And these people figured all that out by just playing with numbers in the sand. No doubt, in some way similar to this, they came up with the Pythagorean theorem, which of course tells us that the square of the hypotenuse of a right triangle is equal to the sums of the squares of the two sides. You don't want me to put that on the board. But number became even more important for the Pythagoreans. They noticed, in the case of music, for example, that there was a kind of numerical relationship, uh, a ratio, among chords. In other words, as they were playing with their stringed instruments, they noticed that when the string is twice as long, you get an octave. And that when you reduce the length of the strings in a certain way, you get a chord, a major chord or a minor chord or a G7 diminished or whatever. They, they didn't go quite that far. They carried that even further and, and began to uh, they even thought that these kinds of musical harmonies, these kinds of musical ratios, had some kind of bearing upon the, 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 the distances between the planets. And they thought that the planets were giving off music and that if only we humans could hear the music that the planets give off, we could hear the music of the spheres. They had an interesting theory about the universe they taught that uh, the Earth was round. I mention this in case any of you ever become contestants on Jeopardy. Columbus was not the first person to suggest that the world was round. The Pythagoreans knew this. The Pythagoreans also taught that the Earth was not the center of the solar system. The center of the solar system, they taught, was a, 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 phys, a, a planet that is not visible from our position on the planet Earth. If we could travel to the other side of the round planet Earth, we could see this heavenly body that they called the central luminary. And they believed that the Earth rotated around this central luminary. They believed the sun, here's the Earth, here's the sun, here's the moon, whatever the number of the known planets was in that time. And so they had, they had a, a more sophisticated understanding of the solar system than many of us, uh, than many of us uh, uh, recognize. Now, in their belief that the human soul survives the death of the body, and in their belief that the human soul survives in different forms of life, it may be human, it may, it may not be human, they tended to, they, they, they functioned as an influence on a number of, of, of ideas that will come along later, and we will see some of those ideas operating in Plato's, um, in Plato's view of things. I mentioned um, 
There was one other thing I forgot to mention with Heraclitus. He was a, uh, he was a decided critic of the mystery religions of his day. This occurred to me after one or two of you came up to me during the break. I will be saying more about the mystery religions of the ancient world uh, oh, in a couple of weeks, especially when we look at the middle part of um, the book Christianity and the Hellenistic World. But you see, at the same time that there was the Olympian religion in Greece with the pantheon of gods that existed supposedly on Mount Olympus, there was a secret esoteric mystery religion uh, uh, which in, well actually there were a number of mystery religions that were practiced in the Greek world. The religion of Dionysus um, uh, and the Eleusinian mystery religion and so on. And Heraclitus was a decided opponent of the mystery religions. He ridiculed them. He couldn't imagine people getting excited religiously about dark secret ceremonies in which uh, oft times horrible things went on. Well, aside from Heraclitus' criticism of the mystery religions, the Greek Olympian religion also had its critic, and he's the next philosopher that we're going to mention and mention briefly. His name was Xenophanes. You don't often hear much about Xenophanes. Uh, I'm not sure that Gordon Clark mentions him at all. Possible dates for Xenophanes and remember, this is very approximate, would be somewhere between 570 and 470 B.C. Uh, Xenophanes attacked the anthropomorphic gods of the Greek Olympian religion. Remember, Zeus and all of those other uh, superhuman uh, beings, uh, superhuman in power, but almost subhuman in their emotions and in their, uh, in their moral characteristics. Xenophanes made fun of these, um, of these Olympian deities. And here's what he said. He said, it seems to me that men have made God in their own image. Because <clears throat> the Africans worship a black god and the Norseman's god has red hair and blue eyes what have men done but simply create a finite God in their own image and project him into the heavens? Now, in the place of these anthropomorphic deities that Xenophanes criticized, he offered, and I think this is a very interesting suggestion, he offered the, the belief that there is but one supreme God. And it's at this point that our information begins to fall apart and begins to fail us. When most people interpret Xenophanes, they interpret him as a pantheist. That is, when he rejects the Olympian deities in favor of one supreme god, it looks as though he's worshiping a god who is identical with nature. In our literature, the, 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 the information that survives doesn't really permit us to go any further than that. However, I'm always, I'm always tantalized by the possibility that Xenophanes may have meant something a little more than this. He talks about a God being changeless. He talks about God being unmovable, being eternal, and being at rest. And I'll have to admit to you that sometimes I have an idea that Xenophanes may have been the inspiration for Aristotle's own view of God. The big problem with my little theory is that Aristotle himself ridicules Xenophanes and refuses to credit Xenophanes with any idea resembling that. But uh, I've learned that you can't always trust Aristotle as a fair commentator on his predecessors. He's noticeably unfair in some of the things he says about Plato, and who knows, it's possible that Xenophanes may have operated as an influence upon Aristotle's own view of God. Uh, our literature simply doesn't permit us to make um, a judgment on that matter. I've told you that we're in southern Italy and that we're dealing with some of the um, 
uh, some of the philosophical schools that have their start in southern Italy. Let's mention another Italian school of thought, the Eleatic philosophers. Now their name, Eleatic, comes from the fact that they were associated with a community in southern Italy, a Greek colony called Elia. And there are two major thinkers uh, who represent this school. One of them is Parmenides, And the other great Iliadic philosopher is a man known as Zeno. Plato clearly believed that Parmenides was the greatest of all the pre-Socratic philosophers. We know this because there is only one dialogue that Plato wrote in which Socrates loses the argument. Socrates appears in many of Plato's dialogues, but in only one of them is he beaten. Does he lose the argument? And that's in, an arg and that's in a dialogue called the Parmenides, named after this fellow. The dialogue presents an imaginary meeting, at least I think it's an imaginary meeting, between a very young Socrates and Parmenides at the height of his powers. Now, we have to believe that this dialogue is fiction because Socrates assumes the task of defending the most important aspect of Plato's system of philosophy, Plato's theory of the forms. Now, we know that Socrates never knew about Plato's theory of the forms. This is Plato's contribution to philosophy. It was original with Plato. He didn't borrow it from Socrates. Socrates never in his wildest dreams thought up the, the specifics and the details of Plato's particular position. But in this fictional encounter between Socrates and Plato, Socrates tries manfully to defend Plato's theory of the forms from the ruthless criticisms of, of the great Parmenides, and he loses. Now, you'll find some pages in which Gordon Clark goes through some of this material with you. You'll find it, undoubtedly, a little difficult to follow. The details of the arguments against Plato's theory of the forms are less interesting to me than is the fact that Plato seems unable to answer these particular problems. I've always understood what's going on in this way. Well, at least there are two ways to understand what's going on in this dialogue. Perhaps Plato knew that these objections to his theory could be answered, but he wanted his reader to figure out the answers for himself. That's possible. Or else Plato was saying to the world, look, I know every objection that future generations are going to raise against my philosophy and even though I may not be able to answer them very satisfactorily, I still don't know any position that's any better than this. Well, when you get to that material, and that'll be part of your reading for next week, pay a little attention to those pages. Maybe if the spirit moves and the time is there, we'll take a look at some of those particular arguments. They do show up a little bit later in the history of philosophy because when Aristotle comes to develop his own refutation of Plato, he simply borrows most of his own arguments from Plato's work, the Parmenides, without telling the world, of course, that these were really Plato's arguments to begin with. Now, what could possibly make Parmenides the greatest of the pre-Socratics for Socrates? It seems to have been this feature of his thought. Parmenides is the first philosopher that we can identify as a rationalist. Now, the word rationalist and the word rationalism are words that can take many different meanings. We're going to be saying a lot about rationalism later on in the history of philosophy, later on in, in our text reading, in the, in the course. The way rationalism shows up in Parmenides is this. He believes that there is a correlation between the structure of the world and the structure of the human mind. 
Now, we could point out other things about Parmenides that perhaps are not as complimentary or that, is, that are not as impressive as that, but let's put that on the board. There is a symmetry, a correlation, if you will, between the structure of reality and the structure of the human mind. In other words, the laws of reason that we sum up under the word logic are not alienated from the structure of the world. It's not as the, you see, we want to avoid any suggestion that we poor humans with our poor minds are struggling to understand and know a world which is beyond our power, which is beyond our ability. Now, for someone like Parmenides, the human mind has the capacity to achieve genuine knowledge about the ultimate structure of the universe. When we come to the sophists next week, we'll begin dealing with a group of philosophers who say that human knowledge about ultimate reality is impossible. We can never attain the truth. We can never know the truth. That's not the way it is with someone like Parmenides. It won't be too long in this course before you realize that Gordon Clark is something of a rationalist. He believes that the laws of logic are God-given principles which enable us, which help us in our efforts to discover the truth about the ultimate structure and the nature of the world. I don't want to mislead you here into thinking that Clark and Parmenides have a whole lot in common. Parmenides had lots of problems, and maybe I ought to point out some of them to you. Parmenides, even though he was a rationalist and even though he deserves credit in this point, did get carried away into some nonsense. Perhaps the best way to show you some of that nonsense is to go on immediately to his disciple Zeno, where you can have a lot of fun. And maybe it's a good time today to try and have a little fun. All right? So um, get what you can about Parmenides from the Gordon Clark book. But uh, let's, let's use Zeno as perhaps our best representative of the Eliadic school and how that particular interest in reason manifested itself. What Zeno did was develop a number of interesting paradoxes to try and refute the enemies of Parmenides. For example, Parmenides, and I do not agree with him here, but Parmenides did not believe that anything can move. Parmenides believed that motion is impossible. Maybe I better tell you why Parmenides believed that. Otherwise, you'll think uh, I, I just shouldn't pull something like that out of the air. Here, I, I let's let's pretend that I'm Parmenides, that you and I are going to reason rationally, and I am going to prove to you that nothing can move. All right? I'm Parmenides. I'm going to say to you, students. Let's begin with a rational premise, a claim that is reasonable to believe, that it would be irrational to reject. And here it is. What is, is, and what is not, is not. I submit to you, whether you're a Baptist or a Presbyterian, that that is an eminently believable proposition. Now just think what you'd have to do to deny that proposition. To reject that proposition, you would have to believe that what is, is not. And you, I can tell by looking at you that you're not that foolish, right? Who of you wishes to go on record? I mean, which of you would like to be foolish enough to raise your hand and say, I believe that what is, is not? None of you, see. 
Likewise, who wishes to go on record to say, as saying, what is not, is? What is, is. What is not, is not. That's reasonable. All right, now, <clears throat> let's begin with that rational premise, very reasonable axiom, and see what we can deduce from it. For one thing, we should be able to deduce from this premise that only one thing exists. Okay? Only one thing exists. Here's why. If anything is, it has to be what is. So, let's say this is, the, this, is, this is what is. Now, if you're foolish enough to believe that anything else exists, that there is more than one thing in the world, what's the only thing it could be? That's right. Do you believe that what is not is? In, in, in dreams, he says. Have you ever met anybody who believes that what is not is? No, we can't. So look, if what is is and what is not is not, there can only be one thing. And what is that one thing? Tell me. Thank you. That's very good. And if you want to believe that there is anything more than what is, what is it? What is it? And nobody, nobody, no one with any sense wants to believe that what is not is. Now, here's what is. We've just proven to you that it's the only thing that exists. Now we want to get to the question, can it move? All right? Now, what's necessary before anything can move? Here, notice me. I'm standing. Suppose I'm what is. All right? I'm standing here. I'm occupying this space. Before I can move, what do I need? I need a space to move into, right? Thank you. Now, if this, if this right here is what is, what is this space that I need if I'm to move into it? It's what is not. Does what is not exist? No, thank you. You're catching on real, real, real well. So because there is no such thing as empty space, it's impossible for anything to really move. Now, of course, you're sitting there saying, but Nash, you've been moving the whole three hours. In fact, I can't wait for this three hours to end so I can move. Right? <laughs> but remember, Parmenides is a rationalist. We, you have to make a choice. What are you going to trust? What your reason tells you or what your senses tell you? Now, Parmenides agreed that our senses tell us that things move, but our senses must be mistaken. Once we know by simple logic that things cannot move because there is no empty place for them to move into, all, all appearance of movement must be an illusion. Now, I realize once I get into nonsense like this, I've probably done Gordon Clark a disservice by calling him a rationalist because you're going to think that all rationalists are a little bit bizarre. But I, I went back here just so that you would get in a mood to understand a little bit of Zeno. Zeno, Parmenides' great disciple, decided that he would try and prove that his master was right by developing a number of paradoxes. And these paradoxes are a form of reasoning that we call argumentum ad absurdum. In other words, Parmenides is going to assume things that you believe and then he's going to show you how your beliefs lead to nonsense. And so the only way to avoid this nonsense is to give up your, is your, is to give up your beliefs about pluralism and movement and so on. Now, <clears throat> this would be one good example of Parmenides' paradoxes. Let's imagine a runner who's going to run a hundred yard race, all right? Here's the starting point, and here's the end of the race, and here's the runner. There he is. And so the starter says, ready, get set, go. Now you and I have all watched these things on television, which again is only another indication of how deceptive our senses can be. Let's apply a little reason to this race. Reason tells us that before this runner can run the entire hundred yards, he must first run half that distance. 
Is that right? I defy any of you to run a hundred yards without first running half that hundred yards. You can't, you can't run the whole unless you run the half. Now, before the runner can run half the distance, he has to run half that distance, right? You can't run half the distance unless you run a fourth the distance. Before you run a fourth the what, what am I doing here? How you have to run half that distance and half that distance and half that distance. How long can this process of dividing space up into half, how long can we go on doing this? To infinity. Is an infinite number of spaces a very big number? Well, it, it's... it's <laughs> Is traversing an infinite number of spaces a time-consuming process? Well, what Zeno wants you to see is, remember, he doesn't believe that space can be divided. He doesn't believe that things can move, but you do. And so all he's asking is this. Since you believe that spaces like this can be divided, it's up to you to explain how this poor runner can begin his process. How can he even move in the first place? because before he can move any little bit at all, he's got to move half that distance and so on to infinity. Next paradox. You remember the, the story of the tortoise and the hare, which most of us remember through Bugs Bunny movies. Remember cartoons where Bugs Bunny got in a race with a turtle and the turtle always run, uh, won? And that's, that comes right out of Zeno. Z Zeno set that up a little differently. He said... The tortoise challenges Bugs Bunny to a race. Bugs says, what's up, Doc? The tortoise says, oh, I want to challenge you to a race. And Bugs says, man, this is, this is great. When, when do you want to race? Any, any time. But I just want one slight concession from you, Bugs. And what is that? That you give me a little head start. Not much. Just a little head start. Well, Bugs Bunny says, you are the slowest creature afoot. I guess I could be a little tolerant here and give you a little head start. So here's our little turtle, and here's our hare, and uh, the starter shoots the gun, and off they go, all right? Now, we'll assume, this is a different paradox, we'll assume in this story that Bugs Bunny reaches the point from which the tortoise started the race. We'll call that T1. Now, of course, the tortoise, as slow as he is, is no longer there anymore. He may not have moved very far ahead, but because some time has elapsed, he's moved a little bit ahead, so, so he just isn't there when the tortoise, when the hare gets there. So we'll say that at this, by the time Bugs Bunny gets here, the tortoise is somewhere slightly ahead. Now, by the time Bugs Bunny reaches the point at which the tortoise was, when Bugs was at the first point where the tortoise was, the tortoise isn't there anymore, okay? He's moved on ahead ever so slightly, and to make a long story short, and Gordon Clark goes on forever with this story, poor, the poor rabbit can never pass the tortoise because whenever he gets to where the tortoise was at the last instant, the tortoise is somewhere ahead of him. <clears throat> and so the smart tortoise, who was a rationalist, and a student of Zeno and Parmenides ends up winning the race. Now, I'll give you just one more of these paradoxes, and then we'll see if you have any questions. This is really my favorite one. You've all seen archers shoot arrows, all right? Now, let's imagine that this is our arrow flying through the air. Zeno asks this question about our arrow, which is shooting through the air. He says, is it not true that at every moment of its flight, the arrow occupies a space equal to itself? In fact, let's do this. Let's come up with different times during the so-called flight of our arrow. T1, T2. Now notice that at every moment of its supposed flight, the arrow occupies a space equal to itself. 
But don't we have another phrase for, for, this, for this phrase, occupying a space equal to itself? Isn't this simply another way of saying the arrow is at rest? Now watch. I have a piece of chalk. I'm going to put this chalk on the table. And notice that while that chalk is sitting there, it's occupying a space equal to itself. It's at rest. If the arrow is occupying a space equal to itself at every instant of its supposed flight, then the arrow is at rest during every instant of its flight. Therefore, the arrow never moves at all. Now, you can see this, thanks to the, to the uh, magic of modern uh, movie making, by taking a, a moving picture of our supposed arrow, of course, moving pictures don't move either. You realize that. But you would find that if you could freeze the frame, in every frame that arrow is sitting still. If it is at rest at every moment during its flight, then Zeno says it never moves at all. Now, some of you, when you were in school, learned that old poem, I shot an arrow into the air, and it fell to earth, I know not where. Well, now you know why that sucker could never find that arrow. He was out looking in the woods, and it was back where it started from in the first place, see? Nothing moves. Now, we can have a lot of silly fun with these paradoxes. I could give you one that would keep you awake tonight. But we must move on to more important things. But what is the lesson to be learned from, the Parm from Parmenides and Zeno? Two lessons, I suppose. Lesson number one, reason is going to occupy an important role in our efforts to understand the universe. We must never turn our backs upon logic or upon reason. That's one lesson. But there's another lesson here, which I'm afraid does get lost in the shuffle, and that is we must be careful not to use reason in silly and irrelevant ways so as to jeopardize its significance for people. I'm always a little troubled because as a rationalist, and I happen to be one, uh, I do get excited when I come upon Parmenides, but then I realize that I may be, I may be doing rationalism a disservice when I, when I trivialize it by going into all of these silly games and paradoxes that Zeno... Uh, that Zeno left us with. Well, let me pause for a moment. We still have one other school of pre-Socratic philosophy to look at. We're going to finish them today. That's great. But let me just pause for a moment and see if there are one or two questions before we go on to this last school. Yes? Why is it that when they start off with what is, is not in that general con concept, which is in the mind, why is it they, they feel... Uh, they take the next needed step in motion to prove it, to articulate a concept that first starts in the mind. Why does it have to now become motion to articulate it being true or not? All right. Uh, I'm not sure we could, um, I'm not sure I could paraphrase that question for the rest of the class, but what you're really saying is, given the importance of rationalism, how is it that these people, whom we should credit with some intelligence, could start out with such apparently innocent axioms or starting points and end up in such nonsense? Is that really what you're... Why, why choose motion? Why, you know, when you say something is and something is not, you're talking about concept in your mind. But now why go on to use motion as oh, the concept of your truth? Why, why not pick something up and stay in the mind? Why do you well, they did. They, they did uh, Parmenides did talk about a lot of things. He talked about plur plurality, and so he tried to show people that there are not a variety of things that exist in the universe, that plurality is really just as misleading and deceptive as motion is. But your point is, if you're going to be a rationalist, why then make this quick jump to a phenomenon that is clearly tied to experience? Yeah. Well, yeah. Like, again, you're, you're using parameters, again, that are in the sense realm when you just start out saying that it's rational. Well, perhaps we could, we, could, uh, we, could a we could answer for Parmenides in this way. He wants people to realize that whenever there is a conflict, between what logic tells you and what your senses tell you, you'd better go with logic. There are all kinds of apparent conflicts between what your reason tells you and what your senses tell you, at which point we have to make a choice. Which will I trust? 
And Parmenides' answer is, we must trust our reason, which leads to this, to this, to these paradoxes where, you know, wh which of us really believes that things don't move? I certainly don't hold to that nonsense. So, <clears throat> maybe what we need to learn from Parmenides is that somehow we've got to look for a better way of tying together our reason and our experience so that we don't get into this conflict, this struggle. Would you buy that? Because as he left things, there is this tension. Our reason tells us one thing and our senses tell us another, and then he puts us into this dilemma where we have to make a choice, and that, leads, uh, that, that results in our apparently denying all kinds of common sense truths about reality. That automobiles don't move, that, re that lights don't change, that accidents don't happen, and they do. And I haven't answered your question. Um, I'll keep trying. One or two others, because we do want to finish the, the next group of people. Yes? Did Zeno ever get out of bed? Did Zeno ever get out of bed? Yeah, I'm sure he did. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's hard. The, these things can be fun, and there are many more of them. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's natural to wonder what kind of a life these people live. Um, if motion is impossible, um, you know, did Parmenides ever go down to McDonald's for lunch? I don't know. Um, so what's best, I think, for now is to not lose sight of his important lesson, and that is that the structure of the human mind does have an important linkage with the structure of reality and not get mixed up with all of these little puzzles and paradoxes. One last question before we start the, the pluralist. Yeah. Do these puzzles remain unanswered, uh, or do we look at their basic assumptions? We can point out their fallaciousness at the beginning. Uh, I have a former professor at Brown University named Wesley Salmon who published a book called Zeno's Paradoxes. Uh, they are extremely difficult, even today, with all of the computers and higher mathematics that are available to us. Uh, uh, some people have said that before Zeno's problems could, uh, could really be handled, somebody had to uh, discover the infinitesimal calculus. And other people have said the discovery of the infinitesimal calculus hasn't really helped at all. Um, if you want another example of this, there's an apologetics textbook out there, I think it's even in our library, called Scaling the Secular City by um, J.P. Moreland. J.P. Moreland begins, and I, I, I begged him not to start that book that way. And I hope J.P. Moreland doesn't listen to this tape, unless Vanna White loans it to him, I guess. J.P. Moreland begins his apologetics book by proving the existence of God on the basis of reasoning about infinity that gets you into the same kinds of problems as Zeno's paradoxes. Have any of you read J.P.'s book? In other words, what he's trying to show you is that an infinitely long series of causes and effects is impossible. Well, if an infinitely long series of causes and effects is impossible, then the world must have had a beginning in time, and that's supposed to get you into uh, a rhythm where you, you have a, an argument for God's existence. The only problem is uh, you go nuts trying to figure out all of J.P.'s examples. For example, he talks about a hotel that has an infinite number of rooms in them. And how many guests do you have to move in order to get... Um, I, I, I got lost about page 13, I think. If my ability to believe in the existence of God depended upon my uh, ability to understand the Kalam argument for God's existence, I'd be in deep trouble. Um, so I just offer that to you an as an example of how this stuff about infinity can, um, can, can confuse even, even the best of philosophers and mathematicians, and uh, probably we ought to move on to things that, that make more sense.